This is the Balanced Growth Show with Dr. Travis Perry, helping successful business professionals like you achieve balance in their lives. Welcome to another episode of the Balanced Growth Show. I'm your host, Dr. Travis Perry. Today, I am privileged to have Mr. Gary Cardone. Gary is an American entrepreneur and business leader. He was born in 1958. He's the CEO and co-founder of Chargebacks 911 and a payment processing risk mitigation firm that helps businesses prevent and manage chargebacks related to credit card transactions. Gary has more than two decades of experience in the financial industry and is recognized as a thought leader in the field of chargeback mitigation and fraud prevention. He's been featured in numerous publications, including Forbes, Business Insider, and Entrepreneur, and is a frequent speaker at industry conferences and events. Gary, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Travis. Good to see you. Absolutely. It's been fun to get to know you in pre-show and, and hear your experiences. Um, honored to have you and really grateful. Tell us a little bit about your story. How, how did you get into where you're at today through the financial industry? Um, you know, how, what, what got you to this point? Um, well, it's a very, uh, unusual career journey. I don't think anyone, uh, when you're in high school or college, when you're doing your whole planning, which I didn't do, um, but my kids are going through their whole planning right now. I'm like, how can you possibly know what you're going to do? Cause I didn't know what I was going to do. I studied marketing and economics in Louisiana, really, uh, found myself, in high school and college, quite frustrated the whole time. I felt like I was a, a thoroughbred. I didn't think about it that way, but I thought I felt like I was a thoroughbred that really just wanted to race. And I kept feeling like the school system was just basically one big block on me. I um, was fascinated when I got out of school to go start learning about the real world, most of which was not taught to me in the, in the school system. Um, Went to work for the oil, in the oil and gas business, and there was a significant regulatory change that was going on in that marketplace. And my career will have these pivot points where every industry that I moved into, which would be in, like I wouldn't have known I would end up in five industries on three continents uh, with my marketing and economics background, no MIT, no Harvard, none of that. Uh, Got in the oil and gas business at 22 years old. By the time I was 42, I had sold all my stock. I was a, you know, started as junior trader and ended up 12 years later running a running and building a European business for Dynegy, which would become a Fortune 30 company. I think there were 12 employees when I joined. So I have this history of joining really small companies. I'm really comfortable in them. I'm not so comfortable in big corporates. Like I'm probably never going to work for Chevron or Visa. Um, you know, they 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 don't appreciate my expensive sweaters, uh, or or in, or or my open communication. And, and look, I'm not saying, trying to say anything about these big companies. Some people are extremely well suited for them. I'm not one of them. Uh, I'm a bit of a disruptor, and when I see things that are like really inefficient, it drives me crazy. Um, did that for 20 years. My CEO told me something, made a comment one day. Um, I think I was making about $7 million a year. And the only reason I was at that company was I was making $7 million a year. I, I was starting to get tired and bored. I knew the game really, really well. And I realized in the back of a limo one day at 39 or 40, I'm like, hey, the only reason I'm here is because like my ego is keeping me here now, the money and the ego. I was having headaches all the time. My boss said, hey, we're going to make a billion dollars in cash next year. And I am a, a pretty observant person in marketplaces. And I knew that it was impossible for us to make a billion dollars in cash unless we went into the drug business. Um, I gave him my notice. I gave him six months notice, sold every piece of stock that had that was in the money like every option I could sell. I had not sold any of that stock for 17 years. I sold it all in one afternoon. Dumped everything on that comment at $54. And I watched that stock go to 54 cents in six months and nobody got out. So my timing, I have been really blessed with timing. Uh, 
you know, in this age that we live in, I, I don't really talk too much about God, but I talk about the gods of commerce and I have been blessed by the gods of com- commerce being in the right place at the right time, but also being able to observe that market opportunity. And uh, although maybe I'm not extremely well educated, uh, I have the ability to pull a trigger that's like, it's just a gift. Once I see something, I'm like, hey, I want to go spank some money in that I, on that idea. And I think putting money behind an idea is a really good thing because it it, 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 you know, I, I meet a lot of people that have all these great ideas. I'm like, hey, well, let's put 50 grand on it. And they're like, no, 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 50 grand. I mean, well, dude, like you like the idea. Let's go test it. And it's surprising to me. People don't put money behind their idea. They just want to like, hey, let me pitch you this idea. And you put the money behind the idea. So uh, stepped away from the, the world of business for six years, studied religions, history, took time off my, why did I do that? I did that because everyone in business told me, to your point on balance, that you have to start a career, you stay in that industry and you work till your 401k is so big that you you, you get to leave and all your health benefits are paid for. I'm like, I don't want to work every day for a 401k. Okay, I, I don't want to work so my insurance can be paid when I'm 72 or 82. So, and I met a man that ran British Gas PLC, one of the biggest companies in, in the United Kingdom. And he had taken off seven years prior. He was the CEO of the largest energy company in Europe. And he took off seven years and went sailing around the world. I'm like, and he got, a, got the most significant job in Britain. Uh, I'm like, hey, that is a good model. So I took, I, I, I quit. I quit and I said, look, am I a one shot wonder? Did, did I just build a couple of businesses and I was lucky at the right time, right place? Or can I go into another industry one day and redefine myself? And so after about six years of being bored, that was a mistake, not a mistake, but it, it was not as productive. Intellectually, I need to be stimulated. Um, I don't like playing golf with people like you every day. Like I, I have zero interest in spending six hours on a golf course, four days a week, talking to the same old people. Um, I met a woman in Las in LA. I was living in LA at the time, met a woman that was flying with me and she dragged me into the credit card industry. We couldn't figure out if we wanted, she wanted me to help her with her business. Cause like many entrepreneur founders, whatever this term means, uh, she had she could not figure out how to make money. And she underpriced herself like many, many founders do. And she was doing more consulting type services. So anyway, she drags me into the credit card industry. That's when I saw this problem with plastic, uh, with chargebacks. And uh, she had the idea in fairness to her. I didn't understand it because the world I came from don't have those problems. There, there are no consumers. I don't like consumers. And uh, we played around with payments for a couple of years, realized the problem and built a company called Chargebacks 911. Today, now that is a great success story because that shows that you can move from one industry to another. Now, all the information that I learned in the oil and gas business serves me across every industry. Now, every industry is exactly the same. The common thread is there are five large consulting firms that have a playbook by which they push that playbook from industry to industry. All the CEOs are measured by the same things. The analysts are looking at their stock price. And it, I realized, oh, wow, the only thing different about industry is nomenclature. That's it. So yeah. if you can work through the nomenclature and learn that a credit card transaction is highly correlated to some of this language in energy and now blockchain and crypto, it is for me now. I can move from industry to industry and I know exactly what needs to happen because business is done irrespective of if it's a piece of art, real or unreal, NFT, digital, analog, business is always done the same. You have right. to make a profit. Okay, you got to pay your expenses, you got to get credit lines, uh, and you can't run out of fuel. No matter how great your idea is, you can't run out of fuel. Well, and I want to pull us back a little bit. Like you, you made a huge decision. You were getting paid extremely well, and you wanted to buck the system. You were tired of the system. Well, I didn't want to buck the system. 
Yeah. I didn't want the system to own me. Okay. Yeah. You don't want the system that, that, to that's own very you. Different, for sure. right? I just don't yeah, yeah. see people, but people see me as a fighter. And it's yeah. really interesting because like, hey, I'm not telling anybody they should do this. Yeah. I don't want to be owned by. It, right. No. It was just me. I I want, you know, I remember Cat Stevens. You're old enough to remember. I know Cat Stevens. One of the greatest artists ever. And, and like the guy that ran BG, British Gas, mm-hmm. Cat Stevens one day said, I'm quitting. I'm going to go study in Islam. I'm done. Yeah. And that really freaking impacted me because I was like, wow, the ego or lack of ego required for him to, whether it was a good decision or not, for him to make a decision of something higher, in his case, Islam or God, yeah. over notoriety and attention is a really, talk about addiction. Right. Uh, so I, I found that to be really compelling. I just didn't want to be owned by yeah. uh, my, my desire to be successful. I, I love it. I was telling a client yesterday how I left being a financial advisor because I was sitting here telling people what to do with their W-2, 401k investments in the stock market. And I found that owning your own business is the best investment. So I had to leave and I had to become someone who could help grow businesses. Um, but it's interesting that you, you said you went and you studied religions and history. I'm fascinated by this, Gary, because I honestly think that what you did was uh, you, you left you left a very comfortable job, right? Um, with with one with one conversation, and you sold everything, and you you took this leap of faith to study religions and history. Um, I think that's a balance play. I, I really think that's something that's important to you. Then you realize I, this is more important than my job. I'm leaving. So let's talk about this. What what did you study in religion? What did you study in history? What where did you go? How did you do this? Let's talk about that. Well, I don't know that we have enough time to get into all that because it's a it's a uh, it's I've always been interested in the field of history and religion, mm-hmm. um, and I'm not sure they're re- really different. Um, I'm also not sure that all of it and maybe most of it is accurate. So my guidepost is I like to study a lot of different things. For, for instance, uh, one of my strategies, somebody asked me once, they said, hey, wh- what exactly do you do? And my explanation is that I study markets really well. And I have this framework of being able to look at a market like the credit card industry or blockchain or the energy business from my past. I have learned to go all the way back to the wellhead, actually to the bank, who provided the money for Exxon to drill a hole in the ground. I was able to understand all the math associated, what it costs to do that, and then all the way to the consumer. But once you can do that on a decatherm of energy or a kilowatt of electricity, it becomes pretty easy to do it on a credit card transaction. So you just follow the money, right? Um, so, so the, the, the balance act for me it, it is that if, if I go into this story and believe that all our history is tainted with some propaganda and not truth, right? Not, not accuracy, then probably every business is also following this obscure type, you know, hey, these are the rules, but um, so for me, uh, it, it, it was a way for me to learn more about the things I don't know about. Okay. And the things I don't know about, I mean, I think those are the de- most dangerous things to any business person or any person that's not in business. Really, I don't think it's a different. If you don't know yourself and you don't know what's driving you, then I, I start making mistakes. And, and for me, business has become fairly easy. Uh, it is r- really about finding my spot and not over business like the, the, the balancing conversation is challenging for me because if you and I were in a military operation right now, we wouldn't even consider the idea of 120 hours a week. We would say, hey, that's our deal. Bullets are flying right now. And if I got to work 140 hours, I'll probably shoot you in the back of the head if you're only working 40 
and I'm working 120 and bullets are flying. I, I, hey, let's just get rid of traps because you're a problem. I mean, seriously, on the battlefield, that is the way we would look at that. Right, right. right. Well, why is it if 78% of every person in the United States is going to end up dead broke on their deathbed uh, where their kids have to pay for their everything? Like my kids will not put me in a grave. I will have my secretary do all the work. And, and my kids can like do the celebration part, right? Why, why are we going to dump it on my kids to bury me? Um, so, so for me, um, I, I look at a business like a military operation. And if, if my competitors are the size of Visa and MasterCard, I might not want to go and invade the entire continent of Europe at one time. I might want to find my spot, right? And, and that's, like, I have done that really well. I, I build a construct for a problem. Think about it as a military operation. I don't send a battalion. I send three Navy SEALs out there, and they do some recon. They do intelligence gathering. Salespeople, for instance. I think salespeople are intelligence officers, and they're so busy thinking that they have to fire a weapon they don't need to fire a weapon. The first thing they need to do is find out where the targeted market is and what their needs are, either what their weak point is that you can exploit or what is it their need is so great that you can actually support them. And salesmen, and like I know a lot of really cool people that pitch this whole closing, like people think I'm a salesman. I am not a salesman. I am a strategist. And, right. and, and, and like, I don't need to be a salesman. All I need to do is sell myself on what the business opportunity is, I have been really good at defining these opportunities, moving into them and exploiting them when other people fail. I don't know why they fail, but one thing I do is I am hyper-focused on it. You know, you're going to say, hey, Gary, you own all these businesses. I may own a bunch of little businesses or big businesses, but I'm only focused on one or two of them. Sure. Like, well, like I, when I roll into them, I, I really put a monster amount of energy. I think I did 700 hours on an airplane once in one year for chargebacks 911. Now, that was not balance. Right. And I, I think I want to focus on this, the, the whole idea of the military operation, right? You're, you're the strategist, as you said, but you're not the Navy SEAL. And you're not the guy flying the helicopter, dropping off the Navy SEAL. You're not even, uh, you know, the guy on the ground doing reconnaissance for the Navy SEAL to go on the ground. Like, you're not everything. And I think well, that's the point uh, that I uh, want to uh, point yeah, out. Yeah, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I think that that's actually not accurate. So the, the role I play in all these businesses is I am the Navy SEAL. Because when you've done this your whole life, I lost $140 million one year, okay, on a trade. Got into a, a trade. I was in England. Got into a trade I couldn't get out of. And I'm, we're part of a public company. I'm swinging monster weight around, okay? I'm calling up Enron going, hey, I'll sell you 300 megawatts of power for five years. I mean, that that's close to a billion-dollar transaction, okay, on one phone call. So I'm extremely upside down on a trade. Now, what we were trying to do is 600 people working for the company. What happened was that I removed myself from the front line and listening to these markets. And I was delegating to other people. And I realized, man, I have a gift and I just delegated it to someone that doesn't have the gift. Okay. Now, I, I got confused because I'm sitting there. Well, I'm, I'm senior management. I need to learn how to train these people. Uh, this is a kind of like a magic trick. Okay. I mean, it's a gift that not everybody, like my twin brother has it. Okay. I don't know how we got it, but he and I talk about right. this thing that goes off in our chest. If this goes off, I I'm all in. Mm -hmm. It only goes all in. It only goes off a few times, but when it happens, I'm like, okay, I am going to commit Harry Carey here. My twin brother called me up one day. He said, Hey, what are you doing? I said, dude, I just did the biggest trade of my entire life. And he's like, well, how, how good could it be? I, how bad could it be? I said, it's a career killer. If it goes bad, I lose everything. And his response was, oh, my God, dude, how could you do that? And my answer to him was, 
dude, I will hate myself in the morning for not doing this deal. This is the right deal. And I have to jump off the ledge. Only one guy is going to jump off the ledge and this opportunity is going to be gone. So, you know, it's one of those things you, it may. Now, it turned that $140 million loss into $300 million profit. So, but that was a pivot, see? So, so had I been sitting in the back delegating, yeah. okay, you know what my boss 4,000 miles wanted to do? $140 million deep in the red. He said, hey, let's double our position. Okay, now I had some great bosses. They were, I mean, for a guy to go, dude, you're public company, we're down, let's double up. And I said, no, no, Chuck, it's the wrong thing to do, okay? I made a mistake. This trade is wrong, let's get out of it. Now, getting out of that trade and acknowledging it was bad. Hey, we we have people that are getting killed here, mm -hmm. allowed me to pull the troops back, pivot, and then go make a, a hellacious amount of money on a different trade. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I think, you know, for me, if I wouldn't have been on the front end as a spear, now, do I maintain being the front? No. No. I, yeah, I think that's the point. Once yeah. you pierce the area, I then hand it over to Travis and go, hey, Travis, look, here's Chevron. Tr Chevron, Travis is my number one man, dude. He's going to handle you from here. What? Now you've learned the rhythm of the market. You, you Okay. Then I move into another space that is unknown to other people, and I open that up. That's right. my job, right? And I love that. I love that about you. You're, you're, you're identifying something that I call your sweet spot. What is your sweet spot? What is it that Gary does really, really well? And you know, if that is to find the deals, if it's to crack the markets, if it's to target that and be the front spear, as you were talking about, and then back off and delegate, that's your sweet spot. But you know what? Most business owners I found as I've trained them, they don't know what their sweet spot is they've got it in their head and they're too afraid to spend most of their time doing it. They're doing all these other stuff because they're afraid. Does that make sense? So I want to learn from you. I want to know, where do you gain this passion? Where do you gain such um, faith, such you know, passion to be able to do what you know you do well? You know, For your brother Grant to call you and be like, man, that's crazy. But for you to go ahead because you know it's right, I want to learn from you. I want to know what makes you able to get past what other people really struggle with and focus on your sweet spot. Maybe I'm just lazy, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, you know, no, I don't when, think so. When I was a kid playing baseball, I was left-handed and, and then I had a problem with my left arm. So I had a coach who uh, taught me how to throw right-handed uh, but if my arm wouldn't have like gotten had a problem, I would never have gone through the work of learning how to throw right hand. OK, like who wants to do that? It's a lot of work. Um, do I really want to learn accounting, man? I mean, I probably could be good at accounting, but it's going to be like pulling teeth. And every other one of my skills that the universe gave me are going to be come. You know, gray plastic, nothing. So I think people don't know what they're good at and they think they have to be everywhere. I mean, I have a partner that, you know, it, it's just in her ego to like need to be on everything. And I'm like, God, ah, we have an investment banker. They're the experts. Let them help us. We have lawyers. Let them help us. I don't need to look at everything. Um, if I do see, that's when you start hating business. I like painting a canvas. I don't necessarily like going out and buying all the paint. That stuff is kind of less interesting. If I have to do all that, then I'm not going to paint. Right. Okay. But if I can go paint and don't care if my clothes get dirty, like I, I'm, if I want to go paint, I'm going to go paint. I'm not going to worry about changing my jeans. Oh, well, I, I got, so like, but I think some of it is down to laziness is that I am pretty good at a few things. Um, and I think the greatest thing that I'm good at is actually telling a story to help people understand what it is, what the opportunity is that I'm trying to achieve in telling that story. It normally comes off as a debate. It appears to be a debate, 
But what in reality, what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to get as many people to tell me how crazy my idea is. And if they have been in that particular industry for 20 or 30 years, and I keep hearing it over and over, it further validates my idea. I actually love people saying, you're crazy. I'm like, really? How many people can tell me I'm crazy? Um, every business I've had, every one of them. Natural gas, this will never happen. It took me three years to get a meeting with ExxonMobil because they were like, we have no interest in this. Uh, the credit card industry, for me to get a meeting with the, the CEO of Visa or MasterCard, nearly impossible because this industry is so obscure, so blocked, so locked down. I moved to the blockchain and crypto, get a meeting with anyone. Right. What's the difference? Yeah. The difference is one industry is 50 years old and they don't want to lose their toys. And the other one is a brand new industry that is so sharp intellectual protocols and intellectual capacity that the CEO of every large company in the world will meet with anyone that has something valuable to say or an idea that translates into the future digital economy, which is so exciting. It's unbelievable. So I look at this digital economy and coming from the plastic analog world and the electricity world, which is very analogy. And this is for sure going to happen. Like, our universe that you and I live in in the next five years is going to change so massively. You and I won't even know. But we will not be able to understand. The bio you just read from was done on chat GBT this morning. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? The first time I've ever done anything on chat GBT. <laughs> I'm terrified of it. Okay. And I just pumped it out to you. Now, it's not right. It's not accurate. But you know what? I got you a bio that you couldn't find in two minutes. Did, in two huh? minutes. Yeah. It just yeah. populated. Boom. It's not embarrassing bio. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, it doesn't have node 40 on it. It doesn't have a lot of my real estate stuff. It, it saves so much time just now. So exactly. that's what I'm going to go spend some more time on that thing. Right. So yeah. um, if you're not, see, see, think about the balance. We have so much disruption change hitting us right now. Who is in balance? I'm pretty sure ExxonMobil is not in balance right now. I'm pretty sure Visa and MasterCard are like, whoa, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. I am certain the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, and the IMF are absolutely tinkling down their little, little legs right now going, whoa, there is so much global change going on. Right. Now, if you're a business guy, a real business guy, and you can't see opportunities going on right now, this is the greatest time in the history of mankind to build a business. First off, no longer do we have to underprice and give everything for free since the interest rates move. The whole Palo Alto model is getting crushed right now. The mm -hmm. SaaS model, all these guys selling stuff for $1.95 and they really needed $195. Uh, it's all happening right now. And I like building businesses now because I get to go to my partners and go, nah, I'm not selling you this for 150 bucks, dude. It's 2,500 bucks. Okay. There is no business at 150 bucks. Okay. Like you're trying to do business with a vendor and you're winding him down so tight that he's going to fail because he's not going to make any money. He's going to be constantly looking for another, another user. And this is exactly what the SaaS models have done. Unless, of course, you can hook, you know, 8 million. Netflix users, and they don't really know what they're being billed for. Um, so this is, uh, I think the whole world's up for grabs right now. I, I think there is no safe entities. And I mean, I read a report this morning that said this is going to be the largest colossal default of venture capital private companies in the next 18 months than we've ever seen. And I think that's probably true. Um, a bunch of startups had ideas based on cheap, cheap, cheap money, and that's gone. And uh, if you built a business on zero cost interest and thought this was going to be here forever, uh, I think your, your business is probably dead and you should think, be thinking about pivoting so aggressively right now. Um, maybe, maybe it helps that I was born in, you know, at the very peak of birth 
So therefore, when you're 18, guess what? You're competing with the largest population of people on the planet That's in true. the middle of a recession. Yep. So these recessions for me, I'm so comfortable with them. Me and my brother have always grown up in them. Like, oh, wow, man. So we yeah. treat money correctly, right? Yeah. Well, and it brings up a good point. Good to great. They talk about birth order, birth place, uh, you know, when, when, when you were um, born and who grows up in certain time periods that they're able to be successful. Like Bill Gates was able to get a hold of a computer because of, you know, down the street at, and he was able to be in that library and, and create these programs to get him to where he's at today. Like we're all standing on sh- shoulders of giants. And I, and I appreciate you bringing this up of, Hey, you know, maybe it's, Maybe it's when I was born and resilience that you've learned to stay in that sweet spot. So I know we only got a few minutes left. What advice would you give to other entrepreneurs who are, you know, facing these next 18 months? They're in this disruption model. What, what would you tell them if they've built their business in the wrong spot, if they're not in their sweet spot, or if they're in a, you know, a job or a position that's not really granting them the opportunity to be in that sweet spot and and you know do they make a pivot do they leave do what would you suggest they do obviously Gary this is a loaded question with lots of different scenarios but in general what principles would you um, give to them uh, I would say that based on where I see the world moving um, and I think change happens ex- much faster than people expect. We're always wrong about how, when it's going to happen. Um, we have the largest population of MBAs, people from Wall Street moving uh, their entire car- career trajectory. And if you're not looking at that, or you're in high school and your counselor is not telling you this, or you're in college and your counselor is not telling you this, or you're not studying anything about AI, blockchain, or crypto, or how money is made. Like most of the people that are listening to this have no clue what money is versus currency. Um, and that that just that education would be good. The pivot... Um, I, I think you have to look at yourself in the mirror as a company and as an individual and ask yourself this. Does the company I work for or the idea I have bring value to my customer? If it brings value, how much? What's it worth? If you say that you're, the company you're working for, social media company, is not bringing value to your customers, that you're proud of, you should pivot. ASAP. Like every business I've ever been into, I bring real value to my counterparty. If I don't, I don't send them a bill. If I send them a bill accidentally and they're unhappy, don't pay me. Okay. Like I, I, that's just a fundamental, like I am bringing back. This is why I always like to take proprietary positions because I was a trader. See, I lost $140 million. Why do I tell people that? I learned a great lesson from that, man. Better lesson than the money I made. Okay. I learned from my mistakes. I do not learn anything from my successes. Nothing. Okay. All my successes do is it helps me raise the bar just a little bit or go, I probably competed in a game that I I had too much edge on. Um, I learned from all my mistakes. I'm in the middle of a mistake right now that is so large. I can't even get out of the bloody thing. Um, But this is a life lesson for me now. Okay, I mean, I've been hit with a lot of life lessons. This is a life lesson that most people don't get to learn. And I can fight it. I've been fighting two and a half years into this bloody battle. It will go away one day, right? I will resolve it, but I'm learning something from it. And the more I fight it, like, okay. And, and what I will do is I'll share the mistakes I made. They got me here with other people. And that's like, like, see, I don't think Bill Gates is a great guy. I wouldn't use him as, a, as, a, as an example. I think Bill Gates stole technology from an old little software guy and he freaking made trillions of dollars on it. That's what my belief is. Um, and, and it, it, it kind of makes sense because I don't see a lot of people around Bill that he helped. And I'm like, huh, there are a lot of people around me that I've helped. 
Okay. Like you, you, people send me letters. Hey, thanks, man. So I'm not even trying to compare the two people, but um, I think there's a lot of great people out there. I think there, you know, I wouldn't want to live Elon Musk life, just the, the balance. Right. But do, do we want an Elon Musk here? I think we do. I think it's awesome to have him here. Um, look, I just think that to do anything great, I don't think Michelangelo was balanced. Okay. Pablo Picasso. The, these people are like, if you're genius, if you're brilliant at something, and I think every person that's listening to this is an absolute codified genius in some area. The challenge is go find it, dude. Yeah. It's what people talk about the passion. It's actually, no, no, it's not passion. It's a gift you were given by the universe. And most, and it might be taking care of children. It might be being a mom, dude. Like, yep. I think being a mom Amen. is more important than anything I've ever done by a factor of a thousand. Okay. And too few people are being good moms and too few people are being good dads. If I go to my grave today and all you guys show up at my grave, which I won't have, but if you all show up and go, dude, he was an awesome business guy. I have lived a horrible, horrible life. Okay. If you tell me, Hey, that was an awesome dad. And he was a great friend and he was unique and authentic. That's a good, that's a win for me. Okay. Um, Love it. So I think that's the balance. Like, I don't think you're out of balance if you're doing something you really, really dig. Yeah. And you're being ethical, right? That's, you got to be ethical on the deal. I, I'm with you. I think what I've learned <laughs> from you today, Gary, is find your passion. Be in your sweet spot. We, you know, we call it different things, um, passion, sweet spot, you know, genius. you're genius. You're your genius. genius. Yeah. Yeah. But I absolutely 100% agree with you having a PhD in family relations, knowing the value of a dad and a mom in today's society. Like we could spend hours just talking about that concept. Maybe we have you back on to talk about it someday. But really, um, I 100% put like five exclamations behind that. Being a mom and a dad is the most important thing. That's the reason why I wrote Achieving Balance. And in the very first chapter, I talk about when my dad died. Mm. And, oh, were you? you know, um, I was 26. He was 49. So I've been on this journey to help figure out well, what, what was it? And it was, it was stress. It was a stress-related genetic mix of things that caused him to have the widow maker and pass away on a mountain bike ride. He wasn't lazy. He was working hard. Um, and so I, I've been out here trying to figure out what's going on. And I see this in too many people. But you know that at the end of the day, Gary, he was the best dad I could ever have hoped for. The yeah. best, you know, individual in my life. My mom has been an amazing mom. Like I am incredibly blessed. So my mission is to help other dads and other moms out there to really focus on their relationships, their family, and make sure that that's a big priority, as you mentioned in your life. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for bringing yeah. that up. I know you're successful, man, and I know you're killing it. And I'm going to take your business you know, advice to heart. And I think there's a lot of others who really like this. Please like, share, comment, post. Let us know how we did on this podcast today. And thank you for, for being here and for really giving back to the industry, helping other entrepreneurs make their way and really focusing on that, you know, dad and, and family um, aspect of balance. So thank you, Gary. Thanks, Travis. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Great, man. Thank you.